gracious, and loving God, Father of our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the only true, wise, and living God, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and the Father of Jacob. Dear Master, we come, Father God, with a bowed down head. We come, Heavenly Father, just seeking you, Father God. Father God, we ask you to bless this service, Heavenly Father. Have it to be what you would have it to God be, Heavenly Father. Use us for thy glory. And we'll be so careful to give you all the praise and give you all the glory because you're worthy to be praised. We ask, Heavenly Father, you continue to bless this church. Father God, we ask you to bless our pastor as he continues to lead this church in the direction that you would have it to go. Bless each member, Father God. Help us to be faithful, Father God, to your word. And we'll be so careful to give you all the praise and give you all the glory because you're worthy to be praised. This is your servant prayer that I pray in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But today we just, we're not going to hold you long, but we want to look at one of the Old Testament, which is Haggai. Haggai chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. Haggai chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. I want to thank our pastor for, Father God, just uh let me stand behind this sacred desk, Father God, to be used for God's glory. And I ask each and every one of you all to pray for us, pray for this church, pray for our pastor and his family, Father God. But Haggai chapter 2, verse 20 through 22, and it's read as such. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day, of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdom, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdom of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Amen. Just for a few minutes, with the aiding of the Holy Spirit, I want to talk to you from the topic, God is in control. God is in control. It is becoming apparent that there are many things that this world that we have absolutely no control over. Weeks ago, life was somewhat normal. We met for our midweek service with no clue that within a few days that we would be faced with the decision whether or not to cancel church services indefinitely. There is global chaos due to the coronas pandemic. Fear has gripped our land. Many businesses have closed their doors. The stock market is unstable. The economy may be headed for another recession. And to top it off, our national debt is over $23 trillion. Even before the current situation, we had numerous problems. Social Security is going bankrupt. Wages are stagnant and health care is unaffordable. Our service men and our service women are in harm way all over the world. There are wars and rumors of more wars. Mass shootings are commonplace. Our country is becoming increasingly divided. 
My brothers and sisters, we live in a world filled with trouble, turmoil, difficulty, and uncertainty. Things are bad and seem to be even getting worse. Many of you are dealing with personal issues. You have moral trouble. We have rebellious children, bills that we can't pay, problem at work, health issues, and many other situations that consume your life. But often we are blinded by our circumstances. And we forget, we forget, Deacon, who, who is really in control. When this happens, doubt enters our mind, and fear begins to consume our life. But today I would like to remind you who is in control. It is not the Republican. It is not the Democratic Party. Nor is it the governor, the Congress the Supreme Court, not even the president. God Almighty is, always has been, and always will be in control. When you are tempted to fear, remember that your Heavenly Father is supreme in authority. He is omniscient. That means that he knows all. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10 and 29. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs on your head, they're all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you are more valiant than many sparrows. This is a comforting promise from our Savior. But there is a passage of scripture in the book of Haggai that reminds us that God is in control. You see, God sent Haggai to, to speak to Zerubbabel and deliver a message of great encouragement. In this message, Deke, we can see that God has a sovereign order. God possesses supreme power. And God, in his infinite wisdom, has selected some special people. Let's look to the text and examine the evidence that proves to us that God is in control. The first place of evidence that proves that God is in control is God's sovereign plan. That's verse 20. See, sovereignty is defined as supreme power or authority. God is the supreme authority in history. And he is the supreme authority in our lives. You see, God sent a message to his servant, Zerubbabel. At this point, the process of rebuilding the temple was in its infancy. Perhaps Zerubbabel was dealing with some uncertainty concerning the future. He was God's chosen man to lead this rebuilding process. But imagine the great responsibility that rested upon his shoulder. You see, Zerubbabel was reminded that God was in control. God is still in control today. And he is still have a sovereignty plan. God has a sovereignty plan for this world. God has a sovereign plan for the bride of Christ. God has a sovereign plan for the future. God has a sovereign plan for eternity. God has a sovereign plan for this church. And God has a sovereign plan for you as an individual. God even has a plan for us in the midst of this 
pandemic, even if we are not able to assemble together as we normally would, God still expects us to be the church. There's a work for us to do, D, in times such as these. You see, Zerubbabel was a willing vessel that God would use to carry out his sovereignty plan. In the same way, we should be willing vessels that God can use us to carry out his sovereignty plan. Zerubbabel learned that God planned through the word of the Lord. Haggai went to him with a message directly from the Father. We learned of God's plan for us the very same way. When you search the scriptures, you'll receive a direct message from your heavenly Father. Are you going to pray with me? Perhaps God has already revealed his plan for you for your life. When you look at what he has called you to do, do you think that there is no way that you will ever be able to accomplish that specific task? If you will be a willing vessel and trust in him, God will use you to fulfill his sovereign plan. We can put our faith in God. Because he has the power and the ability to do anything that he pleases. You see, God is in control. Along with God's sovereign plan is the reality that God has the power to accomplish anything that he desires. Consider it, if you will, God's supreme power. In verse 20b, God said to Zerubbabel, he said, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdom of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. See, we get a glimpse of God's sovereignty plan in verse 20 and 22. He tells the rebel that the time is coming when he will shake the heavens and the earth, overthrow royal thrones, and destroy the kingdoms of the heathen. He would overturn their chariots. The horses would fall, and the riders would kill one another. This discourse proved that in every situation, God retains supreme power. In every battle and conflict throughout history, those past, present, and future, God is, always has been, and I always will be in control. Our God is so powerful that he can even use his enemies to accomplish his sovereign will because God is in control. We can be confident in God's supreme power. No matter what comes our way, no matter how bad things may get, God's power will never fail. But let's consider the scope of God's supreme power. Number one, he got power over nature. He can shake the heavens and he can shake the earth. He has power over rulers. Our God is able to overthrow raw thrones and destroy the kingdom of the heathen. He has power over our enemies. Romans 8 and 31 say, if God be for us, who can be against us? We have no need, no need to fear anything in nature, for God is more powerful. We have no need to fear government, 
and ruler. For God is more powerful. We got no need, D, to fear those who would come against us and persuade us and persecute us because my God is more powerful. Whatever comes our way, we can be confident in God's supreme power. We can trust him to see us through, no matter how difficult the circumstances may be. Couple we, we, we the fact that we can be confident in God's supreme power is the fact that we can be comforted by God's power. When you truly grasp that God is in control, there's no need to fear anyone or anything. Many of our brothers have walked away from serving God because of fear. Some have determined the task impossible and not even attempted to move forward. When you come to the realization that the one who has called you to the task, he has the power to see you through, then there is nothing that can stop you from reaching your goal. My brothers and sisters, we can be com confident in God's supreme power. We can trust that God is in control. We're serving God in some uncertain time. But God is not surprised by the events that we are facing, nor is he intimidated by them. God is in control, and we can and should trust in him. Remember, he can do anything but fail. The story is told of a young boy traveling by airplane to visit his grandparents. He sat beside a man who happened to be a seminary professor. The boy was reading a Sunday school take-home paper when the professor thought he would have some fun with the little lad. Young man, said the professor, if you can tell me something God can do, I give you a big, shiny apple. The boy thought for a moment and then replied. He said, mister, if you can tell me something that God can't do, I give you a whole barrel of apple. God has a sovereign plan, and he possesses supreme power. There's nothing that he can't do. Let us remember, my brothers and sisters, that in his infinite wisdom, God has chosen to use us to accomplish his sovereign plan. This brings us to our found truth that I would like to consider. God selected people. In verse 23, in that day said the Lord of hosts, Will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shechtel, said the Lord, and will make thee a signet. For I have chosen thee, said the Lord of hosts. You see, in this discourse, God reveals his plan for his man the purpose that is involved. See, God chose Zerubbabel to accomplish a specific task. He had a job for him to do, and God used him to help the captives in returning to Jerusalem. He used him to reestablish the temple to worship, and he used him to lead the building program for the Sucker Temple. Through the word, we find that God was, he was pleased with Zerubbabel service. God had a remnant of people to choose from, and he chose. He chose Zerubbabel. In fact, there were more prominent people that God could have used, but he chose Zerubbabel. I believe one reason, D, that he was chosen because he was a willing vessel that the Lord could use. If you are a child of God, 
then he has a specific purpose for your life as well. And he has a specific plan to use us for his glory in the midst of a global pandemic. But like the rebel, we must be willing vessels. If we will make ourselves available to the Lord, he can use us to accomplish things that seem impossible. He can use us to reach a world that is fearful and hurting. He can use us, Dee, to bring glory to his name. Not only is there a purpose for those that God selects, it is also a privilege to be selected. Consider, if you will, that the privilege that is involved in this. He said in verse 23, he said, on that day, declare the Lord of hosts. He said, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. Oh, what a blessing. God had made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, Jacob, concerning the Messiah. There were promises to Judah concerning the coming king. This promise was also made to David. In fact, the throne of David came to symbolize the Masonic throne of Christ. Zerubbabel was a descendant of David. The lineage of Christ, the Messiah, is traced back to David through Zerubbabel. You can read that in Matthew chapter 1. Verse 12 and 16. The rubble would be a part of something great long after his death. The fact that God chose him to accomplish what he did concerning the temple was a great privilege in itself. We have already covered the fact that God is all powerful. And this proves that he doesn't, he doesn't have to use us to accomplish his will, but he chooses to use us. And there is no greater privilege. You're right. Thank you, Jesus. There is no greater privilege than to be called by God to serve him in any capacity. Let us not forget we will be held accountable for our service. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the thing done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. At the judgment seat, after our works, we be put to the fire. There is the potential of some of what we did in this life to remain. What will remain? What we did for Jesus is what will endure the fire of his judgment. This will be the basic for reward. Every deed done in the name of Jesus will be blessed and rewarded at the beamer. The Bible tells us five commas, five crowns that are available as rewards to the faithful saint of God. The incredible crown, the crown of life, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, and the crown of glory. We are chosen. We are chosen by God to fulfill his purpose and his privilege to be chosen. To know that we will be rewarded is absolutely amazing to me. The best part about the reward is the fact that we will then be able to offer them to our king. Revelation 4 and 10 and 4 and 20 elders, they fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crown before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. 
Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. This should be our motivation, my brothers and sisters, for serving our master. We have been selected to serve. We have been saved for a purpose. What it seems that a function what God has called you to do is impossible. Remember that God is in control. God has a message for Zerubbabel. And that message is some truth that still apply today. God has a sovereign plan. God possesses supreme power. And in his infinite wisdom, God has selected some special people. In the beginning of Haggai, the temple was abandoned and it lay in ruin. God was not pleased and he confronted his people. He chose Zerubbabel to lead the rebuilding process. Eventually, this very important task was completed. And God was pleased, and he was honored. There's work for you to do, though the, task, though the task may seem impossible. If you will surrender to his call, he can use you. And you will see that nothing is impossible when God is in control. We're living, my brothers and sisters, through a situation that we could have Never expected. We don't know what the future holds. Our lives have been turned upside down. But God has a plan for his people. And God can use us to reach a lost and dying world. Right now, the, right now people are searching for answers. And we know the answer. His name is Jesus. Let us point him to him as we navigate these, navigate these troublesome times. Let us never forget that we are children of Almighty God and God is in control. If you're struggling with something in your life, anything, recognize that he got up to help you with your struggles. If you're hurting, remember, he got up to ease your pain. If you're sick, remember he got up to heal your disease. By his stripes, you're healed. And I claim it for you and for me. If you're worried about tomorrow, remember he got up for all of our tomorrows and they are as today for him. If you're feeling really blessed this morning, just remember we are blessed because he got up. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I thought about him last night as I was still thinking about him this morning. There's not a day that goes by that I do not think about him. Why do I spend so much time with him on my mind? Because he got up. The reason that we serve Christ because we believe that he rose from the dead and that he is alive forevermore. We believe that he died on the cross. He died for my sins and for your sins. He died so that we would be able to live forever in the presence of God the Father. I think about Jesus because he had, if he had not gotten up, I would not be standing before you this morning. You see, I know for myself that he got up. I heard about it, and then he revealed himself to me. I am a believer. That will not stop me from being a believer. Why? Because he got up. And because he got up, I can endure everything that I must in order to do what he has called me to do. Because he got up, I am more than what you see standing before you. Because he got up, you are more than what I see sitting before me. Your failures are there. And they have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. Your hurts 
although the pain might still be present or going to be eased, everything that you face, you can face it with confidence because he got up. So from this day forward, when someone asks you why you serve him, just tell him because he got up. When they ask you how can you smile in the midst of your pain, tell them because he got up. When they ask you how you made it through, tell them because he got up. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. Amen. Your life is not your own because he got up. There's more to you than you know because he got up. Accept him this morning and allow him to reveal himself to you. May God forever bless and keep you is my desire and my prayer. Amen? Amen. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No the hell I know if thy withdraw thyself from me oh well the shall I go. Praise God. Amen. We thank God for his word. We thank God for our deacon leading us out in devotion. We thank God for our pastor. We thank our God for Third Avenue Baptist Church. It's a pleasure to come out on Tuesday and Wednesday and Wednesday night just to serve God. Amen. God is a good God.